so without further ado, as it's five o'clock right on the dot, my name is Ni Chang Lang. I'm an adult pulmonologist in San Diego, California. I'm the director of pulmonary integrative medicine for Coastal Pulmonary Associates, and we're affiliated with the Scripps Health Network. I also hold a voluntary appointment at UC San Diego as an assistant professor of medicine. And I'm really happy to be here with all of you today covering this really important topic of incorporating anti-racism into medicine. So today our expert panelists include Dr. Michelle Johnson, who is a professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. She is the chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the San Francisco VA Medical Center. And she's passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion and is the inaugural Associate Chief of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the UCSF Department of Medicine. Thank you for being here, Dr. Johnson. And next we have Dr. Christina Harris. Dr. Harris is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at UCLA. She is currently an Associate Program Director in the UCLA Internal Medicine Residency Program, an Associate Vice Chair for equity, diversity, and inclusion of the Department of Medicine and the assistant designated institutional official to lead the equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts across all of UCLA's graduate medical education training programs. Thank you for being here, Dr. Harris. My pleasure. And we also have Dr. Jill Wiener. She's a nationally renowned expert in physician wellness, meditation, and emotional freedom technique. She's an always inspiring anti-racist and created the Conscious Anti-Racism Curriculum with Dr. Maisha Claiborne. And they also published the book, Conscious Anti-Racism in 2020. She hosts a podcast of the same name and is a facilitator in the ACGME Equity Matters Program. Thank you for being here, Dr. Wiener. Thanks for having me. And that's always aspiring anti-racist, not inspiring. Anti-racist, just Thank you. to make sure I'm not calling myself an inspiring anti-racist. <laughs> Thanks. And so uh, Dr. Johnson is going to be uh, presenting first. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And let me uh, start sharing my screen. Great. So can you see my slides? Fantastic. So thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I have no disclosures, and I just wanted to say I appreciate the invitation to come and chat with you a little bit today. And I wanted to give in the next few minutes a very brief history of racism in medicine. And so I will say that the history of medicine and healthcare in the United States continues to be marked by racial injustice and unequal treatment, including but not limited to unequal access to healthcare, segregation of medical facilities, and the exclusion of non-white providers from medical education and educational opportunities, just to name a few. Now, as you can imagine, these factors contribute directly to the racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, which were so profound that the Institute of Medicine, which I believe is now called the National Academy of Sciences, commissioned a report that was published in 2003 called Unequal Treatment. And this report actually shone a light on the racial and ethnic disparities that are prevalent in the American healthcare system. It went a step further and it actually recommended interventions to help um, alleviate these disparities. But um, what's been striking is that this was published almost 20 years ago. And I'd have to say that very little progress has occurred in this area since this report came out. And so one of the big questions that we have or that I have is that, you know, why is this the case? And I think that part of the reason why it's been so difficult for us to get a handle on health and healthcare disparities is that people continue to believe that race is a biologic and not a social construct. And so I think one of the things that I really want to share um, is that uh, race is a social construct, but it continues to be erroneously seen and taught as a biologic one. And this presents problems because when people feel that things are biologic in nature, they think that there's no way that they can overcome them or change them because it's biology. But the fact is, um, race isn't. And, um, and hopefully, as we go through the, um, the symposium today, we'll have some examples um, that uh, amplify that fact. 
I will say that historically, physicians and researchers have tried again and again to use science to show that there are differences between blacks and whites that are not cultural or social, but biologic in nature. And so reports have been made that there are differences in black bodies, that uh, black individuals have smaller skulls and larger pelvises or have higher tolerances to heat. And the unfortunate truth is that these, um, these uh, mistruths and also myths um, have been legitimized because they've been published in medical journals. And these tend to support racist ideologies and discriminatory public policies that are really difficult to get over because of their cementing sort of in our um, medical literature. But as many of you who are on this call know, you know, humans in and of themselves, they share 99.9% .9 of the same DNA. And so it's another way of saying that the differences that you see that may account for the physical differences that you see um, that uh, may uh, ascribe someone to be uh, assigned one race versus another is only due to the 0.1% of DNA that is different between um, us as humans. And so I'll also say that there's greater DNA variability among those within racial groups than there are between racial groups. Again, cementing the fact that race is not truly biologic in nature. And so what are some examples of these biases that have been propagated over time? And I'll say that uh, in 1787, Benjamin Mosley was a British doctor who wrote a treatise on tropical diseases and on the climate of the West Indies. And in it, he claimed that black people could bear surgical operations much more than white people. And he said, quote, what would be the cause of insupportable pain to a white man a Negro would almost disregard? And so, the striking thing for me is that these biases that were prevalent in 1787 are also prevalent today. They persist and they're as strong as ever over 200 years later. And that can be seen in this article that was published in PNAS in 2016, where racial bias in pain assessment and treatment recommendations, along with false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites was presented. And what was very disturbing to me about this study was not only the findings of this um, uh, report, but also the fact that when they asked people about these false beliefs about biological differences, they didn't just ask the person on the street, they asked medical students, right? And so these are the people that are actually going to be treating our patients and forming um, the people that will make up uh, the medical community in a few years down the road. And when they took a look at the white medical students and residents um, surveys, they found that they believed that nerve endings in blacks were less sensitive than in whites, that black skin was thicker than white skin, and that black people felt less pain. And so ultimately these providers um, would be less likely to recommend the appropriate treatment for patients, especially if it was uh, in regards to pain and especially if those patients were black. And so what about uh, women's health? Well, I can say that women's health, especially black women's health has also been hugely impacted by racism. So Jeremarian Sims is often called the father of modern gynecology. And in 1840, um, he actually used enslaved women in Alabama as subjects in experiments to perfect a procedure to repair the vaginal fistulas, which were a complication of childbirth. Now he performed experimental surgeries on these women without anesthesia and without their consent. And he documented the agony that these women suffered in the story of my life, vividly describing how he cut into the genitals of these women again and again to perfect his technique, again, without anesthesia and without consent. So in April of 2018, I'm happy to say that the city of New York removed the statue of J. Marion Sims from the Central Park where it sat across from the New York Academy of Medicine for decades. So the practice of race correction is also a very hot topic. And I'll have to say that this was published in August of last year, and it's an article in the New England Journal called Hidden in Plain Sight, where Vias and his other um, co-editors actually looked at uh, the use of race correction in multiple clinical algorithms that we often um, uh, use in uh, predicting how our patients will do with regards to outcomes, tests, et cetera. And their suggestion was that that the use of race correction as it was described in these, um, I think it was 11 studies, um, may not actually um, be substantive um, to support the use of race in any of these measures. And I'll go on to say that one of the things that um, has been sort of most publicly discussed is that of kidney function. 
race corrected studies looking at the estimated glomerular filtration rate or the EGFR um, has been used to assess kidney function in uh, sort of very, very wide use, not only in the United States, but across the um, across um, multiple different continents. And so EGFR is calculated using the serum creatinine, which is a blood test. And then from that, using different equations to um, assess factors such as age, sex, body weight, and or race that play in coming up with um, a final value for EGFR. Now, studies that were done in the late 1990s reported that Blacks had greater muscle mass. And because this would impact higher creatinine values, the thought was that this should also have um, a factor in the serum creatinine levels and the EGFR of people who identified as Black. And so eventually, this evolved into the current practice of actually using a multiplier between 1.16 and 1.21 for the EGFR in black patients to quote unquote correct for this difference in muscle mass. So if you take a look at the EGFR in your laboratory values reports for your patients, you'll see that there's a value of EGFR that says, you know, for black or African-American patients. And then you'll see another one that's uh, the EGFR for basically everybody else. And so what this does is this results in higher values of EGFR for our black patients, suggesting that they have actually better kidney function. And so why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because this improved value in kidney function may not actually be um, real, and it may delay referrals to nephrologists. It can delay kidney transplant evaluations, and it can definitely affect medication dosing because a lot of that is based on kidney function and the ability for our kidneys to excrete and handle the drugs that are being delivered. And so because this is such a hot topic and because different institutions have handled this in various ways, there's been a joint task force that's been assembled by the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology to assess what is the appropriate use or inclusion of race in the estimation of GFR. And so this is when I have to say that tests for kidney function are not the only ones to come under scrutiny. Um, lung function testing has been um, uh, uh, sort of under the spotlight as well. And I'll start by saying that in 1781, Thomas Jefferson in his notes on the state of Virginia wrote that there were physical distinctions between slaves and their white colonizers, including differences in lung structure. And so 70 years um, into the future, Samuel Cartwright, um, who was inspired by Jefferson, was a physician who was considered um, um, an expert in diseases of the Negro at the University of Louisiana, which is now Tulane University. And he was one of the first people to actually measure pulmonary function using a spirometer. And his results were that the deficiency of the Negro may be safely estimated at about 20%. And he felt that forced labor could vitalize the blood and correct this problem of a lower lung capacity in um, black um, patients, particularly in slaves. And so by this logic, he felt this is why uh, slavery should be continued because it actually kept black bodies alive. So I'll just go on to say that we continue to use race correction in pulmonary function testing, although we're um, uh, preferring to call it race adjustment because it is calculated a little bit differently than the EGFR. But the truth of the matter is that this correction, which is on the order of about 10 to 15% in patients um, who identify as Black or African American, and about 4 to 6% in those who identify as Asian, is built into the programming of our PFT machines. And so it's something that sort of happens in the background for everybody who undergoes a pulmonary function test because it's part of the software. And so not only is it part of the software, so it's very difficult to change even if you wanted to, this is actually being taught to our students and trainees as a standard of practice. And I'm not entirely sure that this is the best way to go about doing it. The actual story of race correction or race adjustment in PFTs is much more complicated and far more nuanced. And I'll just say that there are a lot of people um, who are dedicating time and effort into trying to figure out well, what is the best way to address this problem. And hopefully we'll have um, an answer um, that will emerge sometime soon. I do have to say though that uh, any um, history of race and medicine can't be discussed without mentioning at least the infamous Tuskegee study that left an indelible mark against the public health research um, uh, processes in our country. And for those of you um, who um, may not know this, I'll just say that in 1932, public health service researchers recruited 600 poor black men in Alabama for a syphilis study. And they were promised that they would get free blood tests and free treatment, except that 399 of these men actually were in the placebo arm, so they never got treated. Um, and they were basically observed with syphilis until they died. Um, and not only 
where they observed until they died, but they were spreading the disease to their wives and partners unknowingly because they weren't informed that they had syphilis. And so basically it was a process by which um, our public health service watched people um, who had syphilis spread it and then um, uh, do so unchecked. In 1947, penicillin became widely available, but it wasn't offered to any of the people that were in the study. And it was only until 1972 that the study was finally exposed and shut down. And the only thing that I can say that came out of this that may have done any good at all was that this led to mandatory consent and IRB policies that are still in use today. And then uh, lastly, I can't uh, go without uh, talking about the lack of uh, consent with experimentation that happened in the story of Henrietta Lacks, who is the person who gave us HeLa cells. And so Henrietta Lacks was a 30-year-old woman who was diagnosed with cervical cancer in a Baltimore hospital in 1951. It was one of the few hospitals that actually saw Black patients during that time. And so a sample of the cells uh, from her tumor were sent to Greg, George Gray, who was a noted cancer and virus researcher. And the startling discovery that he made was that unlike other cells that he had received from patients with cancer, Henrietta's cells actually didn't die, but doubled every 20 to 24 hours. And so hers was the first human cell line to be immortalized. And these cells have been used in critical medical breakthroughs, including the development of the polio vaccine, cancer treatments, and IVF um, uh, therapies. And in 2020, Nature published an editorial commemorating 100 years since the birth of Henrietta Lacks, saying that her cells are basically the workhorse of biomedical research, and it's really hard to disagree. These cells are still in use and can be uh, available for purchase today, and I have here a screenshot of um, where you can order HeLa cells for, including the cost, $495 for a small vial of these cells. But despite all of the advancement that these cells have been involved in and the fact that you can still buy and use these cells, her family has never received any restitution. So just really quickly, I'll go on to say that um, the lack of opportunity generated by structural racism also really impacts medical care. The Flexner Report in 1910 um, was published and it was an assessment of medical schools in the United States and Canada. And um, Andrew Flexner, who was the author of this report, basically deemed every black medical school in the country as being substandard except for two of them, Howard in Washington, DC and Meharry in Nashville, Tennessee. But he went on to further stipulate that black physicians should only treat black patients. And he warned that an untrained Negro with an MD was dangerous. But at the same time, he curtailed any opportunities for them to get training. And so I have no problem in saying that I think that this report single-handedly lowered the number of black physicians drastically, um, but also damaged the image of blacks as physician for decades to come. And then the last thing I'll mention is the American Medical Association. And so in 1847, the AMA's founder, Nathan Davis, actually made um, no secret of the fact that he wanted this organization to explicitly exclude not only Black, but also women physicians. And the AMA supported policies that systematically discriminated against Black doctors up until the civil rights movement in 1965, when they were pretty much forced to, um, to uh, be more inclusive of um, people of color sort of within their organization. And I'll say that in 20, in 2008, the AMA did something that was um, sort of revolutionary and surprising to a lot of people in that they issued an apology for its history of discrimination against Black and African American positions. And so um, I think I'll just skip to my last slide to say that, you know, what are we doing now that we know that racism exists, has existed, and is continuing to um, exist um, in medicine? And I'll say that there have been uh, many efforts to, to, to actually make uh, medicine anti-racist in nature. And so we're doing this by welcoming discussions on race and racism. And I'll say that there are many societies that we are all a part of that are um, actually um, advocating that we talk about this by the production of seminars and webinars and um, symposia. There's been enhanced educational content for students, trainees, and faculty across schools and societies. There's been recruiting and retention of diverse medical school faculty um, and workforce, and it's become a priority of institutions and healthcare systems because we need to reflect the 
um, the diversity of the patients that we serve. Um, there's been uh, an increase um, in the interest um, to uh, um, eradicate health and healthcare disparities. And I'll also say that the ATS has a workshop on race and PFTs. It has been meeting for about a year now, and hopefully we'll be able to come up with some recommendations in the future. And that um, there have been multiple efforts to enhance the pipeline of under underrepresented minority physicians, both by the ATS and the NIH sponsoring um, grants and funding for health disparities research, but also um, in sponsoring um, underrepresented minority researchers who are um, basically um, uh, sort of in a very uh, few numbers and are trying to um, help uh, increase uh, their ability to contribute to um, medicine becoming more anti-racist in nature. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for your time and I look forward to your questions at the end of this uh, symposium. Thanks so much, Dr. Johnson. And next we have Dr. Harris. All right, everybody can see my screen, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic introduction. You covered a lot of ground, congratulations. Um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about resident education and learner education, medical students, um, and all the other learners that we have at our hospital. Um, and so I'm gonna, my comments will be focused about anti-racism in our hospitals as it relates to our learners. I have no disclosures. I wish I did, I have none. Um, the framework, there's multiple different frameworks or ways that you can think about approaching this. Um, I'm going with the Josiah Macy Foundation um, framework and, um, and they're up there. So building a culture of an inclusion and respect, um, integrating curriculum centered on health equity, representation, similar to what Michelle mentioned, and then lastly, developing and assessing systems to mitigate bias and eliminate racism. So I'm gonna attempt to go through all of them quite quickly. Um, so let's start. Um, this belonging, I love the word belonging. When I look at this, I, you know, we all understand this in order to really learn and achieve as much as we need our learners to achieve in residency and in fellowships. Um, this sense of belonging is really pivotal. I must say, I have an upcome, a rising sixth graders. So we're in the process of picking middle schools. And I thought so very much about where will she fit? Where will she feel like she belongs? Because I realized middle school is a very, you know, and high school is a very important time just like medical school is, just like residency is, and just like fellowship is. Um, we tend to sometimes underestimate the importance of belonging, but it's something that is really, really pivotal and central to our learners achieving their, their peak, right? and being ready to come out and, and take care of patients. So building a culture of an inclusion and respect, of course, is you know, vital to achieving belonging. And I could probably put up, you know, 20 different articles over the past year or past few years that really focus in on what do our underrepresented in medicine or minority residents in this case, what are their experiences like in their, in their training workplace? And how does that impact them reaching their pinnacle, that sense of belonging, right? So if it's, you know, sometimes it's a daily barrage of microaggressions, and we know microaggressions to be the subtle but offensive comments or actions that are directed towards minoritized populations or non-dominant groups, that's often unintentional, but often based on a stereotype, right? Um, so, you know, in my role as in residency and as the GME director, I have so many stories from our trainees. I have so many stories from my own life, from my colleagues' life, about what it is like to deal with these constant micro insults. They call it death by a thousand cups, bias, as well as discrimination. You think about minority residents feeling the need to take on the task of being an ambassador, right? Like feeling like, you know, they can't just be a fellow. They have to be a spokesperson sometimes for their entire race because sometimes they might be literally the only one. Um, and then also the challenges of negotiating their personal and professional identity. This is, you know, training is where we figure out who do we want to be, you know, and so trying to navigate that space while others, people seeing them as others and potentially even them seeing themselves as others. 
right? And so when I look at this slide, I think about some people get to just do training and focus on the medicine and being the best doctor. And some people get to deal with all of these other structures and factors all at the same time. And that's why I do what I do, right? That's why we're here. This is why we wanna to try to make things better. And of course, you know, you, you don't have to be a minority or anybody to have imposter syndrome. Anybody can have it. But when you think about what it might be to be the only one, um, uh, syndromes like the imposter syndrome, so self-doubt and fear that you will be exposed as a fraud or that you're not supposed to be here. When you look around and no one else looks like you, you know, I think the next question is, well, do I, what, am I supposed to be here? And oftentimes this is amplified by, you know, comments or assumptions that sometimes get made. Like, oh, I know why you got into that medical school. You know, assume, making the assumption that I didn't get there based on my own credentials and my own hard work, right? Or also this idea of stereotype threat. Um, and which is the concern that others' judgments or your own actions will negatively um, stereotype you. So it leads to, you know, I would best, it's, it's basically like the example here. So if you tell, they have all these incredible studies in psychology, like you tell a girl like, oh, women are not good in math. And then you give them a math test. Well, guess what? You know, they just were primed with this idea that, oh, women aren't so good in math. And so they do poorly on the math test. If you tell them, oh, women are great, you guys are analytical, what have you, it changes how they perform. Right, so that's stereotype threat, and that's what many of our learners are dealing with every day. So when I think about building an inclusion, a culture of inclusion and respect, I think about not just diversity, right? Because I think a lot of programs say, "Oh, we want to have diversity, diversity, diversity," but and and we will talk about the benefits of diversity. But how do we critically engage these differences? How do we? What are the settings and opportunities that we create for our learners to get to know each other and um, be able to learn from the diversity of each other. And while this talk is on diversity within race, but there's diversity in lots of different, you know, realms, diversity in geography, diversity in like um, past experiences and attributes. So how do we critically engage these differences and how do we build this sense of academic belonging? Um, so I just have a few questions to pose. So when you're thinking about your training program or your hospital, um, the learners that you're interacting with, who has been included and supported in medicine historically? How might I facilitate inclusion of a broader range of identities and perspectives? What does that look like for me in my job, right? And if you don't happen to work with learners, what does that look like for me in my clinic or in my hospital? Right, so we are all perpetual learners, I will say as physicians, I wish I, every day I'm learning something new. Um, so I think these are still transferable. What assumptions am I making about my learners, educational backgrounds or frames of reference, um, what backgrounds are coming from, um, and how can I be aware of my own biases and guard against these biases in my interactions or assessments of learners? Integrating curriculum and center on health equity. Um, you know, I think that we are slow, medical school curriculums are over the past, let's say, maybe five to 10 years, are much more active in trying to incorporate in equity. I feel like in the GME space, the residency and fellowship space, we have lagged behind. So, from when we think about our formal curriculums, what topics are represented? which are not, which populations, you know, are, are getting represented, which are not. How do we talk about race? Um, uh, reflecting on the talk that we just had, do we use it as a proxy or is it really contextualized? Health disparities, are we talking about them? They're there, right? Do our learners come out understanding what a health disparity is and how, why it actually exists, the underlying reasons? My goodness, if we don't know why it exists and how it got there, how are we ever gonna be able to um, change the narrative going forward? And how do we include the role of community in our teaching, right? Many of us sit in these ivory towers um, and you know we are surrounded by these incredibly rich communities. Like how do we, how do we bring them in. And then there's the hidden curriculum, right? So not the formal talks, 
you know, the ways that we do our doctor thing, you know, the, the way that we might treat one patient over another patient. So how are historically marginalized people treated when they get admitted to our floors? Are they given the same respect or are there, you know, little differences, decreases in rounding times or what have you? Um, and what assumptions do we make about our patients? And what process do we have to mitigate this impact? The third pillar is increasing representation. And Michelle kind of talked about it. And I'm not going to go through all of these numbers, but I did just want to highlight. So the top being the national statistics for our race ethnicity for these um, five different race categories um, and ethnic categories. Clearly California, so we looked at California's Latino population, it would look a little bit different um, with Latino population being higher. But if we go down and we can take, let's say the Latino population, you can see steady drops when we go from medical students, this is internal medicine residency training class, pretty steady. So we're not losing, medical students are going into internal medicine. But look at this drop when it comes to faculty. Right, so this is completely, and in fact, if I look at my school's faculty, our numbers are probably be, uh, worse. So I have my medical students and my residents who are desperately looking to look, to find faces of faculty who look like them. And unfortunately they can't find them, right? Faculty have not caught up. What are we doing about that? You know, I think at all of our institutions and the reason we're here, we believe that diversity is not in contradiction to excellence. It is in fact vital to excellence and it makes us um, more excellent. We all seek for excellence. Um, and you know, diversity, there's been many, many, many different studies that looking at why diversity really does make us better, right? It is, it is without diversity, we cannot achieve our full excellence. Um, that is founded in the data, and that is definitely something that I believe. And, and as you go forward in this work, um, it's really the foundation of, of, uh, of the lens that you have to have. And when it comes to increasing learners and faculty, you know, as we know, we have many, many disparities in this country, who gets, who has the wealth, who has the opportunities. Um, and some of our learners are able to, you know, make it from high school and apply to medical school and get in and have a nice straight, you know, a few hurdles, not saying it's a hard path for everyone, um, but some of us have more barriers than others. Um, so I say the isms, I might say racism, sexism, classism, all of the isms, and then as well, explicit and implicit biases that definitely are clouding our way. And we say, you know, to go out, come out and say, well, we just want the person who's, you know, who's the best. Well, you know, who, who is actually the better athlete, the person who can make it to the end, despite all of these barriers and isms and biases and um, discrimination every day. So this idea of meritocracy, what you've earned, um, it's, it's truly a myth. Um, because some people have been given more advantages over time. And holistic review and residency and, and, um, and medical school and all of our learner admission policy, it's, uh, if it's a new term to you, it's, it's just the idea of referring to the, it's a flexible and highly individualized process where there is balanced considerations given to multiple different factors, right? So if I'm applying to residency, it's not just about your step one and your step two scores and your GPA. It's really about all of your experience attributes and some of your metrics as well, because um, we know that a lot of our metrics um, and test scores have much, much more to do with how much your parents made and how much they invested in your you know, ability to take tests early in life rather than your um, true ability to master knowledge. And so that's holistic review. But there was a paper that came out not long ago at Mount Sinai that was taking it a little bit one step further. So thinking about an anti-racist recruitment process, you know, with the foundations of redistributing power, mitigating institutional racism, and of course, mitigating personal mediated racism. So I apologize for the busy slides and, you know, the point is just to get us thinking about, you know, just get your mind wandering a little bit and opening up and thinking about like, well, what, what does this mean for me in my space? So who determines our program's mission, right? So who's at the table making these decisions about what our missions are and, who, and which voices are not at the table, right? 
which voices are overrepresented. I think we have a lot of that at our, um, in, within our institution. What assumptions are being made regarding the applicant's metrics, right? So are we saying like, oh, look at that board score. They must be an excellent doctor. Is that, is that our, are we challenging these assumptions? Um, how are biases and stereotypes being present throughout this process? What are we training our interviewers to value? What are we training them to see? What are we training them to unsee? Um, and what patterns emerge when we look at our ranking? You really do have to look at data. You have to look back at the end of a recruitment season and look and see like, okay, let's look at our URM data. Let's follow applicants through and let's see what's happening um, to these applicants. Because maybe there are some processes in play that are hindering our efforts to diversify um, the institution. And lastly, when I think about developing and assessing sim, uh, systems um, to mitigate bias and eliminate racism, these are the three buckets that I kind of think of. So like I mentioned, thinking about looking at data, right? You have to, if you don't, I mean, we're, 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 we're scientists. We like to look at data. We look at data for everything else. Why would we not look at data for our makeup of our resident class and really find, figure out um, what are the factors at play? What's confounding this data? What are the barriers? We do this in our science where this is, um, you know, we have the tools to do that. We need to be looking at our data. How do I, so safe and confidential feedback, what is the experience of my learners? Like we have taken you into our program. What is the experience for them? How do they give me safe and confidential feedback, right? If you don't have mechanisms in play, then you won't know and they will graduate and they will leave with all that information so how do you solicit true experiences um so you can hear and i will say being in my role it is heartbreaking um some of the experiences that some of our trainees are having and i you know having done training i know residency is hard enough without any additional factors. Um, so you have to listen, um, but first you have to ask. Um, and you also have to reevaluate your assessment process. Like how do we grade residents? Like what are we, you know, we're not giving grades necessarily, but what are we looking for when we determine who's thriving, who's great, who's gonna be chief resident and who's actually struggling? So what is the lens? What are the questions we're asking? What are the biases that are implicit in these questions that we're asking? And I know I'm posing a lot of questions towards you because it's a big problem. Um, and so that's why we have to really ask ourselves the hard questions. And I'm going to leave you with two slides. Um, this is AAMC data, and it's looking at, and I'm, this is with regards to the importance of looking back at your data. Um, and it's quite busy and it's looking over time, 2004 going to 2019, and it looks at race ethnicity for trainees, HGME trainees, so it could be fellows, residents, whatever, dismissed, so fired from their program, stratified by race, okay? Um, and so I'll call to attention the green. Um, so this, the green is uh, black, African-American, and the red is Hispanic. And so if you remember from the slide beforehand, the, the green, so there was no year that there was 17% black residents anywhere. So this will tell you that's a lot more green than I know is represented. Cause I just told you that there's like 6% blacks nationally. I think that was the number. But when you really drill down, um, what you can see, and this is, you know, they, and this is data from AAMC again, and this is from 2015, 16, and they put it because it's actually very, very striking. The numbers have gotten a little bit better, but they're not, not the, the, it's, it, there's definitely still um, a trend here, if you would say. Um, and so it has anesthesia, family medicine, internal medicine, and basically what you're seeing is how much more likely a black trainee is to be fired from their program compared to a white trainee. And sometimes I'm putting the, lat uh, the Latino. And at the very, very bottom in the most extreme in this one year, and again, it's got a little bit better, but my goodness, it is not great. Or you take orthopedics. If you were Lat Latinx, 14 times more likely to be fired. If you were black, 31 times more likely. Internal medicine, we must be better. 12.3 mm, times um, more likely to be fired. What is that about? 
we are scientists. We need to figure this out. These are people who we have admitted into our program based on their experiences and the fact that we think they will thrive and something is going on. And I would argue that maybe that something is that we are, um, we are not, we have to, first of all, we have to be mindful, but I think it's also potentially some of the lens with which we are um, approaching some of our underrepresented trainings based on the legacy of racism and bias um, that is intrinsic in who we are. So with that, I will leave you with a quote from Amanda Gorman from the inauguration. We, you know, if I look, think about that last slide, it's easy for me to feel like, oh my goodness, the system is broken, but I would say we're not broken, we're just not finished, we're not done, we have work to do, and guess what, everybody gets to do the work. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. And next we have Dr. Wiener. Hello, I am just getting my slides up here. So Dr. Johnson, Dr. Harris, thank you so much for those incredible presentations. What I'm gonna to try to do now is bring this, the focus to like a personal responsibility. Um, there's so many systemic issues. And I think where we run into trouble is when we say, the problem is out there all those other people are doing those bad things and I'm not the problem. And I'm gonna be the first person to say I am part of the problem. And I have biases and I have been indoctrinated with systemic racism, just like everyone has. And so my, my voice as a white woman in this space is to really like say the stuff that no one wants to say and say the, um, get the conversation more comfortable um, owning our contribution um, and, and our meaning white people, but also the whole system uh, is impact, you know, it's made up of individuals. So um, my conflict of interest is that I do anti-racism education professionally uh, as part of my job. I'm the founder and CEO of Conscious Anti-Racism LLC. All right, so I just wanna do a quick check-in. Um, there's been a lot of information. I'm just wondering how many people here, uh, and you can put it in the chat perhaps, um, or you don't have to comment at all. How many of you have felt uncomfortable during the first two presentations? Um, did you recognize any of these issues in your own practice, organization, or training program? And if so, how did that make you feel? And just if possible, noticing where you feel that inside your body. Is it like pit in your stomach or is your heart pounding a little bit? Are you wanting to defend yourself and say, oh, I don't do that. That's not me. Um, so just check in with that and note it. There's nothing to do other than just observe. I'm going to chat with you about the concept of white supremacy culture, what that means, what it doesn't mean. I'm going to demonstrate some ways that white supremacy culture can show up in healthcare. We've already talked a lot about um, Dr. Johnson um, and Dr. Harris both spoke about so many different ways that racism shows up, systemic racism shows up historically and currently, and we're gonna take it a little bit more uh, abstract uh, in terms of these, uh, the ways that the culture uh, is. And we're gonna talk about ways to recognize it in our personal and professional lives, even when we don't wanna hear it or believe it. What I'm not gonna be able to do is cover everything we need to know and do. This is a very beginning thing uh, be as, as we all have been here, the, the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. So let's start with a case because we all love doing cases. A 55 year old white male pulmonary attending uh, presents after a difficult conversation with his black female trainee with the following symptoms. He's feeling having some defensiveness Certainty that his opinion is the one right opinion and frustration at the unfairness of it all. He says that she was getting confrontational and asking questions about something he said on rounds and it made him feel like she was questioning his authority and what he knows is best for his patient. He said that he worked hard in his training and he had to pull himself up by his bootstraps to make it this far and how could she be questioning him? And he's looking to you to comfort him and make him feel better about the interaction. After all, he didn't intend to cause any harm, so why was she being so sensitive about it? Let's recap his symptoms. He knows what is best for his patient. He wants you to comfort him and make him feel better. He's pulled himself up by his bootstraps or believe that he believes that he has. He's got some defensiveness and he believes that his opinion is the one right opinion. So if these are the symptoms, 
what's the disease? And I'm, I don't think I can actually see the chat, but please feel free to put stuff in the chat as I'm talking here. So the disease is white supremacy culture. Uh, and, and I'm just gonna invite you to pause and take a moment if you haven't normalized the use of these three words together, um, take a moment to, to feel how it, how, it, how it feels for you emotionally or how it feels in your body to hear those words. So what is white supremacy culture? And I'm gonna talk about what it's not also in a moment. So um, Dr. Harris was talking about this as well, like the, the culture of a residency. And there, there was a really great quote, um, Oh gosh, I meant to write it down, but but about what culture is um, it, it, when you're swimming in it, like you're swimming in it, the longer you swim in it, um, the less able you are to see it. So the culture is really, uh, and this is from um, Dr. Tima Oken, who's an incredible uh, anti-racism educator and her website is here at the bottom. Um, she has this whole article that she wrote about symptoms of white supremacy culture and um, and what white supremacy culture actually is. And if you have not read the, the article, I highly recommend it. So a culture reflects the beliefs, values, norms, and standards of a group or a community as you know, bigger and bigger or of a healthcare system, perhaps. White supremacy culture. And, and I will say that culture is generally not codified. It's often silent, it's understood. It's not explicitly taught a lot of times. Parts of it, parts of it are. White supremacy culture is the widespread ideology that's baked into the beliefs and values and norms of all of these groups, including healthcare, that teaches us overtly and covertly that whiteness holds value and that whiteness is value. And conversely, that blackness is not only valueless, but also dangerous and threatening. Check in with yourself on how you're feeling right now. None of us, no, no one wants to hear this. I, I promise that I am, I am, uh, it's, it's not easy to hear. So for anyone sitting here thinking, gosh, it's not me. I don't, I'm not that. I, I'm, I'm not racist. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the good ones. I don't do any of these bad things. I'd like to share an analogy that I've heard in several different places that I definitely did not um, invent on my own, create on my own. If you can imagine a toxic, we're all pulmonologists or I'm not, but this, this group is pulmon or, you know, pulmonology. Imagine a toxic uh, factory, just pumping toxic fumes into a community. And whether or not you want that factory to be there, whether or not you work there, whether or not you uh, own it, it's still in the community and it's still pumping this toxic gas and fumes. So whether you like it or not, you're breathing in the fumes. It may be making your eyes teary and red. It may be affecting your lungs. Maybe it's upsetting your stomach. And there's all, all sorts of other toxic uh, uh, side effects of that smoke that you don't even realize, but it's just like, just part of the, of, of becomes a fat part of the fabric of who we are. So that's what white supremacy culture is. It's, it's the air that we breathe in, in our country and whether we like it or not, whether we want to or not, we get, uh, we breathe it in and we get indoctrinated in that. What white supremacy culture is not, because this is really, the, the words are very, um, they're, they're loaded and they're triggering for a lot of people. So white supremacy culture is not the same thing as white supremacy or white supremacists. It's not exclusive to the KKK, although of course that is also part of white supremacy culture, the Confederate flag and white power rallies. Um, it goes way, way, way beyond that. And it's in every single part of our culture and every system. White supremacy culture is not something that people do intentionally for the most part. And it is also not a personal attack on you or your inherent goodness as a person. Because like I said, it's in all of us and you can be a good person and also have it in you because that's the way the world works. So who does it affect? As Dr. Oken says here, it comes after all of us. We're all swimming in the waters and we're all navigating it regardless of our racial identity, but we're not all affected in the same ways. So white supremacy culture can get internalized within a racial group or within any, any group that's not um, kind of top of the white supremacy culture food chain, which would be white, male, cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied, highly educated, et cetera. 
So, and that, that internalization will make people question themselves, question their right to be somewhere, question their abilities, maybe um, think bad about other members within their racial or ethnic category. Um, and then of course, it's also not just internalized, it's externalized uh, also. So what are some of the characteristics or symptoms of white supremacy culture? And, and these are absolutely mind blowing. Again, I recommend the article. So one of the first ones here, denial and defensiveness. Uh, you know, that's not me, that's someone else. You must have what I'm saying, you know, what I said isn't that. No, 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 I'm not racist. The right to comfort and the fear of conflict. Uh, I can't get over, I can't say enough how huge this is, the right to comfort. Um, I, I mean, in my upbringing, it's ridiculous how much of that, like physical comfort, but there's also emotional comfort as well. So again, I wanna state, I'm guilty of all of these because I grew up in this culture. And it's not just people who grew up in the US, it's people in the entire Western world and probably most of the world. So this is not a point fingers pointing game and shame. This is just knowledge, this is learning. And then individualism, this sense that I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and everyone else should be able to do the exact same thing that I did. And uh, Dr. Harris got into this a little bit as well. Um, so does any of this look familiar? If you go back to our case, and now the patient is a, is a white man. He's 55, he's an attending. He doesn't have to be a white man, 55 year old attending to have these symptoms. Um, but this is sort of a, a, a very typical situation that we might see in the healthcare setting. So he thinks he knows what's best for his patient. That's all, that's, the symptom is called paternalism. Um, and that uh, Dr. Johnson got to, the, to that a lot in her uh, presentation, um, thinking we know what's best for our patients, what, how much pain medicine they may or may not need. We, we know these things. And this is really, really ingrained in healthcare. Um, he, he wanted you to comfort him and make him feel better. That's his right to comfort. I shouldn't be uncomfortable. This woman made me uncomfortable. How dare she? You know, she's the wrong one, not me. He said he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and that's individualism. Um, and that's highly, highly harmful to, to people who have not um, been raised uh, with the same uh, privileges and who have experienced marginalization. Defensiveness is defensiveness. He has that. That's what the symptom is called. And his, his believing he has the one opinion is the only one right way. And this gets really important in training programs that the Dr. Harris was talking about with like, we, we have the sense as in this culture, because the white, the white norm is what is normalized. It's what is accepted as what is supposed to be best. And we tend to compare everything to that, but that's not explicit. So it's not like we necessarily recognize that we're doing that, but if someone doesn't meet that standard, that's not perfect by the way, and it's often not functional, um, but, but if someone doesn't meet that, we're like, well, that's not the right way to do it. We do it the right way. And so um, that's also a symptom of white supremacy culture. So no one is immune, as I mentioned. Um, there's this deep, deep seated fear that someone is going to be called a racist. Don't call me racist. I'll do, I'll do anything other than that, but just please don't say I'm a racist. And so people will say, oh, I'm not racist. And you may have heard this terminology, especially since the murder of George Floyd last year started this whole um, awakening in our country. But because white supremacy culture is so pervasive, there's no such thing as non-racist. So we can kind of take this, this ding out of being called racist because it doesn't doesn't have as much meaning because we are all indoctrinated by systemic racism. So the idea is being anti-racist. Pro the problem is, uh, like Dr. Harris was saying, you can't just like make your program poof, not racist anymore or anti-racist. You can't say I'm anti-racist and then you're done. Being anti-racist requires continual uh, conscious decision, self-reflection, questioning yourself, Every decision you make, every policy you uphold or create, every time you're silent, that is either racist or anti-racist. So um, what is our role as non-Black people? And this is a start, of course. Be willing to be uncomfortable. And I, I heard this great quote that a woman named Crystal McCreary told me, uh, she was one of my podcast guests, 
every time we as white people lean into our discomfort around race, um, and I'll say as non-black people too, because there's, I, I feel like white is, whiteness is kind of the, the, the most, the least marginalized of all the races, but I, there are lots of people of color who are also anti-black and who also have their own internalized racism. So this is a very uh, difficult to topic to talk about, but whoever we're talking about, if we're willing to lean into our discomfort, that gives someone else the space and the breath to step away from their discomfort. I'm talking about all the microaggressions, um, the historical racism that both of the speakers have talked about, living with this con constant discomfort of being all the microaggressions and living in white supremacy culture as a black person, being uncomfortable is like, a, it's like a pressure reliever for them. We get to like lean in so that they can take a step away and have less comfort, less discomfort. And we should learn to recognize that discomfort is a sign that important change is occurring. So the discomfort is good, let's lean into it. We wanna recognize the symptoms of white supremacy culture and how they show up in our personal and professional lives. And as I mentioned, there's so many more, um, but once you see them, you can't unsee them and then you can recognize them. And then of course, call them out when we see them in ourselves and in other people and systems. And again, silence is racism. Um, ask yourself what you're protecting. If you are afraid of speaking out, ask yourself why. And then we wanna consciously uh, continue to educate ourselves on how we might be unconsciously or consciously benefiting from and perpetuating the system um, of white supremacy culture. So these are, it's a big ask, um, particularly uh, if one is just beginning to think about these things. Here's a bunch of resources um, and there's a lot of books here, including a book that I wrote with my business partner, Dr. Maisha Clearborn. Um, we have trainings as well. There's an anti-racism daily email series that I highly, highly recommend. Um, just so much good stuff out there. And also my email is here if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out. Thanks so much, Ni Chang and um, California Thoracic Society and the other two speakers for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiner. Um, and so special thanks to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Harris for their excellent talks as well. Um, I wanted to open up the Q&A with the limited time that we have left with what's one action step? So Dr. Johnson covered the history and the national level type of initiatives. Um, so at that level, Dr. Johnson, what would you say or what would you recommend to be an action item that all of us in the audience can take back to our national societies to start being the change that we want to see in incorporating anti-racism in our national medical societies and in even our healthcare system? Talk about it. We really need to start discussing it. We need to address it. We need to call it what it is. We need to not use euphemisms. We need to say, this is racist, this is racism. And we just need to be very upfront about discussing it because until we get over that barrier, we're never really going to get to where we need to be. Thank you. As uncomfortable as that is to do, mm -hmm. it's time to have the conversations. How about for you, Dr. Harris, for our learners? Um, I would really try to figure out how it is that you can get a confidential, objective assessment of their experiences. I think it's, you know, oftentimes we do these annual surveys. Do you add a race ethnicity column in there as well? So you can disaggregate the data. Because let me tell you, when you disaggregate data, you find some very interesting trends. Um, and if you have a small program, you don't feel comfortable doing that, just, you know, exit interviews, tell me about your experience. Of course, you have to have, you know, they have to trust you, they have to, but exit interviews, you can often get a lot of information. People feel more comfortable talking with one foot out the door. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And how about uh, Dr. Weiner, any tips for individual accountability for becoming anti-racist? You had a lot of 
um, suggestions already, but what do you think is the one most important action item that we can all do? That's such a good question. I, I feel like, especially as physicians, we're so afraid to be wrong. And it's so indoctrinated that we're supposed to be right and know everything. And I think it's be willing to like throw out everything you thought you knew about racial systemic racism and individual racism in healthcare and the way healthcare perpetuates it. And, and just allow yourself to like level everything you thought you knew and then just be as voracious about learning what's really happening as you were about your medical studies. Thank you. Thank you for, for all of you for, for contributing to this important initiative discussion. We're just only beginning, much work to be done. And with the minute we have left, I wondered if there was any burning questions from the audience that we can address. You can type in the chat box. And if not. Hi, Dr. Liang. Um, yeah. this is, my name is Nalima Chu. I'm an endocrinologist at Sharpree Staley in uh, San Diego. Um, this was forwarded to me because I'm uh, the chair of our newly started diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, committee. So very happy to hear you three talk today. This was phenomenal. Thank you so much. The question I have, and this was something that um, someone asked, another physician, a colleague asked of me today, and I'll pose it up to you, is yes, uh, definitely agree with everything that you've all said, but how do you handle it when patients are being racist towards you? What recourse do we have? Um, for instance, this provider is a primary care provider talking to this patient. Um, in this patient's mind, the provider did not look Mexican. So he was talking about how COVID is all from illegals and they should be banned and it's all Mexicans and was complaining about another physician he had seen who had an accent and was just really racist and rude. You know, clearly we're all working in medical groups where you can't fire a patient. You know, you have to give everybody fantastic care. How do you deal with patients that are like that to you, what, what recourse do we have? Thank you for that question. Dr. Johnson or Dr. Harris, would either of you or both of you like to? I can start. I think it is, um, it's interesting because we set boundaries with our patients around a whole host of things like a lot of things we're like no nope, can't do that please don't email me at that email that's not for you know what like we are very comfortable if they're in there cussing we're like nope we can't talk but as soon as it starts getting like racially tinge of sorts we're like oh I don't know can I say something I don't all of a sudden we get uncomfortable right and it really is the same thing it's like you have to set boundaries you have to be consistent you can't take away the emotion of course there are you know published studies that talk about the branch points and you got to make sure they're safe and you can't let them die and you know what have you and um, assuming that the patient is not going to die if you disrupt care at that moment it's what what you need to do right because you will find if you are not very stern and forward and just like we don't get to we're not going to use language like that you know, right now we're gonna, I get to be your doctor in this moment. And if I would appreciate it, if you didn't, you know, refer to physicians such as that, if you don't do that, believe me, the next visit, it's gonna be worse and it's not gonna stop. Um, and I have personally experienced that where someone says something and I'm like, well, he probably didn't mean it like that. And then they get bolder and bolder and then it ultimately impacts their care. They get bad care. So they're really doing themselves a disservice um, because they're not going to get the care that they need if we don't set those boundaries. And so it's actually part of us providing good care to them. Thanks, Dr. Harris. Dr. Johnson, do you want to add anything? Or? Oh, yeah. You know, so I'll just add to the excellent comments that Dr. Harris made is that, you know, I think it is also very important to, to set those boundaries, but to be very upfront with the patient and say, that makes me uncomfortable. I think it's okay to tell the patient that it makes you uncomfortable because um, once you say that to them, they are probably uncomfortable too, right? And so just to say very firmly, you know, you know, that, you know, or, or to also say, you know, 
um, everyone here is treated with respect and dignity and equally. And so those comments are not in line with the care that we're delivering to all of our patients. And so, um, you know, if you want to be cared for here, um, and we can say that, you know, sort of uh, in different pockets of where we practice, um, we can say that if you want to be cared for here, then, you know, we expect that you um, respect our guidelines. Um, and, uh, and then if you do, we can have a very fruitful and prosperous, you know, um, uh, um, uh, way forward. But if not, then, you know, that's when you have to start looking at alternate ways to sort of address this patient and their, um, and their behavior. But yeah, address it, be frank, be upfront. Mm -hmm. Can I make a quick comment here? I think if, if, if there's a white person in the practice, in the, if you're an attending and your trainees are being mistreated, I think it's absolutely imperative that we as white people use any proximity to power that we have to make sure that that doesn't happen again. You know, like it's not that it's not that our, you know, Dr. Johnson or, or Dr. Harris couldn't speak for themselves. Of course you can, you can do it better than I ever could. But if it comes to a position where you need to step up for somebody, um, I would always just recommend that like, whatever you think you're protecting or afraid of is nowhere near as bad as the harm that's being caused to your, your colleague or your training. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chu, for that question. And special thanks to all of our speakers and panelists, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Harris and Dr. Wiener. And thank you for listening and um, for your attention. And I hope that you will use this session to inspire you to be the change that you would like to see in healthcare. Thanks everyone.